Hey, I'm Julie Rose. Welcome to Love What You Love. I'm an author, creator, and enthusiast, and I've always been intrigued by the things people are super into. So every week, I'll introduce you to another fascinating human who's into really interesting stuff. Welcome back, or welcome. First of all, our lovely guests want to answer your questions. So if you have a burning question from one of the first 23 episodes of the podcast, at me on social media or send me an email at lovewhatyoulovepod at gmail.com. I'll compile the answers and then I'll share them on social media and in a future episode. So send me those questions. Also, I would greatly appreciate it if you would support the podcast by leaving a rating or review on Apple Podcasts, even if that's not where you listen. I also really appreciate it when you spread the love and you share about the podcast on social media. Thank you very much to everyone who has rated, reviewed, and socialed already. Also, a humongous thank you to all of my patrons as well, especially Allie. You make this podcast possible, honestly, so thank you very much. So if it's not clear from the title of this episode, this is not one to share with the kids or play on your Bluetooth speaker where folks who may be sensitive to swearing can hear. So people who know me in real life, or maybe on social media, will not find this a surprise. But folks who only know me through the podcast or at work might be a little surprised that I curse like a sailor. A lot. Like, a lot, a lot. Which is just one reason why I'm so delighted to talk with this week's guest. Aaron Reynolds is the man behind the internet's most popular profane aviary, Effin' Birds. With hundreds of thousands of followers on social media and an incredibly popular book, Aaron is the patron saint of swearing as catharsis. In this conversation, we talk about the surprising story behind the genesis of Effin' Birds, what's behind the words on every post, how he really feels about birds, and so much more. Just a quick production note here. Aaron had to do our chat outside since his kids were doing remote learning inside. And, of course, there were garbage trucks going back and forth on his street the whole time. Aaron and I agree that garbage trucks invading his interview is completely on brand. So anyway, find out why Aaron loves swearing, and why you might learn to love it even more, too. Thank you so much for joining me today. Thanks for having me. So you are the creator and curator of Effin Birds and also Swear Trek with hundreds of thousands of followers on Twitter and Instagram. You've got merch. You've got a book that came out last year, which is Effin Birds, A Field Guide to Identification, um, a Webby honoree. So you kind of have this whole creative endeavor that is built around swearing. And so I'd like to understand, where did this come from? Why did you start it? I think what's funny is that it's, F and Birds is sort of the, the, the refined, like, fifth or sixth version of, of what I was trying to do. But it all can be traced back to me not liking emoji. Oh, okay. Uh, which is, yeah, I was, um, I guess this is five-ish years ago. And, uh, I, no, maybe even a little longer cause I had changed, uh, where I was working. I had moved from one city to another and I found that my new team were a lot younger than I was. And so everything was texting and emoji, whereas before it was, you know, other, other means of communication at work. And, uh, I was so annoyed by emoji and I started thinking about what I could use in place of emoji to just court, just kind of be, um, I, I mean, not a not a jerk, but to sort of like make fun of the idea of emoji in the first place. And uh, I was watching a lot of 60s Star Trek at the time. And every once in a while, I would pause it and I would get this like uh, amazing, huge emotion expression <laughs> on somebody's face because, you know, TV was physically smaller then. And so everybody's emotions were really big for the small television set. And so I started screenshotting those and I would use those instead of emoji. I would send, you know, Captain Kirk with tears in his eyes, or I would send uh, Dr. McCoy looking upset and angry or uh, Mr. Spock looking quizzical. I, I would start sending those. And uh, I had this big collection of them. And one day I was looking at the one that I had. Um, do you, have you ever seen the episode uh, Wolf in the Fold? It's the, it's the original series episode where uh, Jack the Ripper is like taking over people. It's, it's very strange. 
the, the, the finale of the episode is they knock out the, the guy whose body is being like taken over by Jack the Ripper and they lay him out on the transporter pad and they beam him off into space. Yeah. And I had this screenshot of him lying unconscious on the transporter pad, which is like my favorite thing because it just looks <laughs> like some like like, oh, what a day. And I thought. This would be really funny if I just captioned it with the F word. And then I started looking at all the other ones. And I thought, you know what? These are all really funny if I caption them with the F word. And I was like, you know, what What would I call this? Oh, I would call it Swear Trek. And so the actual first iteration of Swear Trek was stills from the original series of Star Trek, all captioned simply with the F word. <laughs> and um, that was a joke that was good for about two weeks. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and and then it was really tiresome. Uh, and then I started thinking about, you know, what would be a way to you know, take this or extend it or make it funnier? And I hit on the idea of rewriting dialogue uh, and still making it about the emotions, those really big emotions on the screen. And uh, and sort of uh, I, I, like I hate the format, the, the GIF format, but it's the only one that really works for this idea. And so I used it. So Swear Trek is the first. It, it, it came before F and Birds. It came before F and Birds. And um, I ended up being approached by a big media organization because they had really enjoyed what I was doing with Swear Trek. And uh, they were asking me for some pitches. Um, and one of the things that one of the things that they were clearly looking for and that I pitched to them was doing Swear Trek, but with their library of stuff, uh, which would have been hilarious and wonderful. And unfortunately, that fell apart due to lawyer stuff, uh, which is, you know, too bad. I would have really liked to have done that. But they also asked for other pitches if I had any other ideas for social media uh, for them. And I did pitch them uh, something that was essentially effing birds. And they really didn't like it. Like they they thought it was, you know what, it was on this conference call and it was just this long pause after <laughs> I pitched it. And then they were like, uh, let's move on. <laughs> and so I was like, wow. Well, you showed hey. them. <laughs> yeah. And well, so that was it. I was like, you know what? I want to show them that all these other things I pitched them are also good ideas that maybe they should pick one of those up. And so I was like, well, you know what? This one's easy for me to just do on my own. I'll do it for two weeks and show them that it you know, easily gains audience. And, and then I'll pitch it back to them again. And instead of pitching it back to them again, uh, within two weeks, it was considerably more popular than their brand. Uh, so I was like, well, I'm just keeping this. This one's mine. That that rejection was really, you know, a great formative moment. And I, I think that it's very on brand that F and Birds was built out of spite. Right. <laughs> exactly. You know? Yeah, exactly. exactly. So maybe talk a little bit about um, for folks who don't know about F and Birds and kind of what the aesthetic is. So maybe talk about like what it is, where you get the illustrations. Why did you choose that style? F and Birds is at its core, beautiful vintage woodcuts of birds uh, paired with how I'm feeling, usually in a airy manner. Uh, the one that has done really well uh, this week uh, is this puffin uh, with its, you know, with its plumage in disarray that says, can we have a break between clusterfucks? <laughs> and, Please. Uh, um, yeah, exactly. Right. And, and so I just like, I pair all of my emotions and I literally like, I have a note on my phone whenever I feel a strong emotion about something, I just, instead of having that emotion in the moment, I just go, Oh, and I take my phone out and I write it down. And it's been this wonderful kind of like therapy that I don't get angry at things in the moment. I am like, Oh, here's a thing I can use later and will make me some money. So, doo -doo -doo -doo. and so, you know, somebody cuts you off in traffic and it's like, Hey, that's worth money. Dee -dee -dee. You know? So it's, uh, <laughs> Uh, it, it's kind of great in that way. But uh, yeah, so the, the woodcuts, when I was pitching it to that media organization, I needed uh, a way to get it done really quick. And I coincidentally got a spam email about, um, you know, six gigabytes of bird stock art for $20. <laughs> and I was like, ah, $20 is a small amount to pay to, you know, to, to try this out. And um, after having done that, there were really in that package, there were like, about a dozen birds that I really liked. And so I started trying to source them, like figuring out where they came from, because they're obviously, you know, you know, hundred ish year old illustrations. And uh, I just had to figure out where they came from. And turns out they're, they're mostly by a, an engraver named Thomas Buick. And so 
Um, somehow in the last couple of years, I have uh, joined the Buick Society and <laughs> become a collector of Thomas Buick uh, engravings. And um, now I've, I've worked through, for, for F and Birds, we've worked through um, the entirety of Buick's History of British Birds, uh, which is his two-volume opus on, like, every bird in the United Kingdom. And so, uh, yeah, that's, <laughs> that's a major source. While I was doing it, um, I got a very funny, I got a, a, a guy uh, called from the Audubon Society and wanted to do like a short interview for the Audubon Society uh, newsletter. And um, it was really funny because we, we were supposed to talk for 15 minutes and we talked for like two hours. And then like a month later, he said, hey, you remember that thing that was going to be like a short interview? It's a feature interview now. <laughs> and um, after that, I got uh, contacted by somebody in their like publicity and marketing who asked, you know, had I ever considered using John James Audubon's paintings? No. And I was like, well, I mean, would you, would you not sue me if <laughs> I did that? And they said, well, first of all, they're in the public domain. So no. Uh, and second of all, uh, you know, one of our mandates is to keep Audubon's work in the public eye. So no, you know, and so I, yeah, there's uh, every once in a while, there's a beautiful color one. Now, do you actually like birds in real life? Um, I didn't. I try a lot harder now to like birds. People will ask me, you know, they'll they'll tweet, what bird is this? And I'll say, I don't know shit about <laughs> birds. Like, <laughs> but I've actually started being able to identify birds, which is very strange. Now, is this a full-time thing for you? It is. So when I launched the store, the store was a success very quickly. And it, uh, the first thing it did was it helped me not have any debt anymore, which was uh, but then uh, when the book came along, uh, the book was really interesting because uh, first it was a, like a crowdfunded book on a platform called Unbound, which is uh, just a tremendous platform. The idea is it's it's Kickstarter, but explicitly for books. And it comes with uh, a bookstore distribution in the United Kingdom because that's where Unbound is based. Yeah. So, you know, if your book is successful, the print run is funded, the print run gets distributed to bookstores, whether it's a sex success beyond that is, is up to you. Uh, and so, uh, I looked at it and they had said, you know, uh, the, the deal is any unsold copies after the initial print run, you know, after the first, however many months, if they don't sell and they get returned to unbound, you can buy them for this exceptionally low price. And I was like, you know what, let's let's go total worst case scenario. We fund the run and they don't sell after that. At this price, I can afford to buy out the run and sell it on my own website for the next couple of years and it'll it'll go great. So, you know, why don't I do that? And so so I went into it with that as my my thought process. And instead, what happened uh, was we also picked up an American publisher. We're on our third printing in in the United States now. Um, and I think we're on the second printing in the United Kingdom. When the American uh, deal came along, we had a plan at Unbound of when I would deliver the book. And I had, you know, I had worked into it like I work a full time job. So obviously I, you know, I only have this much time to write. So let's just be let's just be realistic about it. And this is how long it's going to take me to deliver the book. And then the American deal came along and they only had one string attached. And it was that I had to deliver it about four months earlier than I wanted to to make it for uh, Christmas 2019 for sales. I went to my workplace and I said, hey gang, um, I have this large offer on the table and I would really like to take it. It would require me taking some time off. It came out at that point that uh, work had been, had been becoming uncomfortable with F and birds altogether. Oh. And they told me really that this was kind of a, a point where I would have to choose between my job of 12 years and doing this book. And uh, that was a Wednesday. And I, I quit my job on Friday. I had done a lot of math to like figure out if just the store could support me. And I was, I was at a place where it, it probably could have but I mean, I have three kids, <laughs> you know, uh, I had a mortgage, I, you know, there were a lot of like stress points that I didn't want to like, trust the inconsistent income of a comic strip about swearing birds, you know, <laughs> Imagine and, that. <laughs> right. And so I started looking around for other gigs, uh, at, that would be flexible or low hours or stuff like that. Uh, it was really funny. I, 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 I put it out there on the Wednesday that I needed a job and I got an offer on the Friday and that's why I was able to quit my old job on the Friday. 
I ended up working for Canada 2020, and I, I still do some work for them. They needed somebody to help them launch a podcast network. Uh, so I went in there and we built a studio and we created a slate of shows and we produced like two seasons worth of stuff. And it was really fun because I kept sort of like finishing one, the, the one task that we had decided I was there to do. And then we would find another one that would, was even more awesome <laughs> and I would go do it. And so, you know, it was like, okay, let's build a studio and get these guys self-sufficient for recording. Okay, let's create some shows and, you know, get them. Okay, let's hire a producer and another editor. Okay, let's, you know. And so uh, I ended up uh, working on a program called No Second Chances, uh, which is a lot more serious than any of this other stuff we've been talking about. Uh, but it's about uh, there have only been 12 women in the history of Canada that have been either the, the prime minister or premier of a province, uh, so a first minister. And uh, they were all alive. Uh, and so we did a project where we talked to all 12 of them uh, about their experiences. And instead of doing like phone calls and stuff like that, uh, we decided what we're going to do is we're going to go talk to them in their homes. Uh, and so we did this. It was it really, it was about three months of recording, but the majority of it was a two week coast to coast to coast trip where I ended up, uh, I was in British Columbia right before I was in Tuxiaktuk, right before I was in Newfoundland. Like we kind of did not do things in the right order. <laughs> we did them in the order of when people were available, but we were at the, you know, we were at the Atlantic, the Pacific and the Arctic Ocean in the span of two weeks. And uh, it was really like a wonderful life changing experience. And so I, I, I love that I can thank F and birds for that. <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. And now, was so your did you was your background in uh, audio production or was this so, something new that you did? Yeah, I no, I had. It was a skill that I had developed at my at my other job at that job I had had for twelve years because uh, that job was a lot of fun. I, I got that job. Uh, it, it was kind of a teaching role uh, uh, for creative projects, and I got it because I had a photography background and interest in videography and stuff like that. And while I was there, uh, they were wonderful about letting me, you know, flex to their other needs because they had a hard time uh, getting people who uh, who had audio engineering chops in the role. I was like, well, I mean, you know, I can, I can I'm good at learning things. Let's learn this. And so over the course of 12 years, uh, that was something that I learned while I was there. And then I had done a couple of podcasts on my own uh, that were just like me goofing around. And uh, and yeah, it was it was really great. And it was like wonderful to, you know, flex that on a much bigger stage. Yeah, for sure. So have there been other doors that have been opened uh, by FN Birds that kind of have blown your mind? Right now, I'm I have two different uh, projects halfway on the go, one of which is a lot less likely to happen than the other uh, because it's truly absurd. But uh, the one of them uh, I've been thinking about for at least a couple of years. I had I'd thought up a very silly tagline for a, like a silly horror project. And then I was like, you know what? I could I could make this work. And so over the summer, I, I broke down the outline for it and I structured it into something that would work as a as a comic book that had, you know, a bunch of good cliffhanger for cliffhangers for issue ends, you know, and um, and I'm it's in a place now where I'm happy with it. And so uh, it's it's uh, it's making the, the pitch rounds now, which is very exciting. And so anyways, if we're really lucky, there's going to be a comic book called Space Werewolf, uh, <laughs> which is uh, the tagline was it's always full moon on the moon, <laughs> and, and which is like the. I just it was like a dumb Twitter joke I made, right? And uh, and then once I thought about that, I was like, well, what are, what are the implications of that? And so the outline uh, that I put together was that it's a uh, a covered up failed '60s Russian moon mission uh, where one of the guys is a werewolf, but he thinks it's going to be okay because it's not that time, you know, it's not not full moon time. But as they start approaching the moon he realizes. <laughs> uh, so anyways, um, and what's really blown my mind is I approached a couple of uh, comic book artists who I greatly admire and respect. Uh, and uh, they're so on board with this project. And so sometime soon, I'm going to have a, a front cover for the, the pitch document. It's just like everything that I have ever wanted 
my life. And so like that's a that kind of door is like I, I I have this opportunity right now and who knows if I'll have this opportunity six months from now. So like, let's, let's take this right now. Well, and I want, I'm, I'm really curious because you seem like, you know, from just talking about your comic book and talking about the podcast project that you worked on, you don't seem like you're a cynical individual, <laughs> but, but so are you cynical or is this, is Evan birds just like therapy, like catharsis for you? Well, I think that it's, I have been a cynical individual Mm -hmm. and I think that I got to a place in the last 10 years where I really was not as cynical anymore. Like I think I found my inner like satisfaction with life, but that undercurrent is still there and I have to remind myself to not be that person. Mm -hmm. Um, but F and birds makes it so much easier because when that person comes out, instead of being frustrated that, oh, I'm feeling these bad emotions again, I'm just thankful for those, you know, for that negative emotion that I write it down and then it just dissipates. And so, like, I don't know that this is a repeatable thing that anybody else can do, but like being thankful for feeling a negative emotion is like... It's something else. And so I don't like to think that I'm a cynical person, although I have always been the person who is good at seeing what the next problem is going to be. You know, like I'm I'm the the there's a there's a bird in the F and Birds book that's called like the forecast for oh, four thoughts heron. That's what it's called. Four thoughts heron. And it's like a Cassandra kind of like bird. And I, I do feel like I've always been that like Like, I don't want to focus on the negative. Here are just some, here are some things we want to take into account if we're taking this path forwards. I don't know that they will all come to pass, but we should probably plan for them. Could F and Birds have happened at any other time culturally? Um, I, I hesitate to say yes. I don't think so. I think that we're in a moment where people really need some kind of outlet for their angst. And it seems like both because of the, the world situations, and there are so many situations actually that are that are frustrating around the world right now, uh, but also because of the way that I, I don't want to say news because I feel like that's sort of uh, targeting the people who aren't at fault here, but the way that engagement is driven online. Um, where everything has to be dialed up to a specific emotional peak Mm -hmm. so that people will click. Um, I think that that has really made F and birds like necessary and a good outlet because things that would, I think in the past have been at the back page of the newspaper at best in small type become an outrage cycle of the day, you know? And I think that it's just like, like there are certainly very large problems right now that need to be addressed, but there are also, there's so much minutia that gets treated that it like, it's every bit as big as the big problem. And I really think that that's about how we consume, uh, news right now. And it's because we don't consume at the source we consume news at the free site that has rewritten the source to get clicks, you know, and that's, I think that's like, I think that's killing us. It's rough right now, really rough right now. So what is it about swearing? I think it's, it's, it's the swearing part I think is actually not as essential. I think it's the, the hook that gets people in, in the first place. But I don't think it's actually the, the 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 hook to the humor as much. Like it's there because it's incongruous with a vintage woodcut, you know, like a beautiful thing that somebody spent days carving, plus the f word. I think it's I think that that is funny on its own. But I think that what keeps people uh, there is the sort of stripped back and laid open emotion part of it and the the ability to recognize that emotion in themselves one of the things that i uh one of the many things that i learned at my old workplace uh was how to get people on the same side as you 
uh, when you're talking to them. And one of the keys is, you know, you want to talk about things that are the same, you know, in your experiences. And you want to talk about those things with as little detail as possible. Uh, because the more details you add, the more opportunities you give someone to say, uh, oh, I don't recognize that as what I'm feeling. And so uh, when I applied that to effing birds, it meant that if I was frustrated that someone had cut me off in traffic, I would write something about it, but I would start peeling away the specificity because um, if I say I was cut off in traffic, the person who doesn't drive a car doesn't resonate with it. If I say I was cut off, you know, maybe the, the, the person who's on a bicycle can start to feel it or the person who was uh, butted in front of in line can start to feel it. Do you, do you know what I mean? Like there's, there's a way to take away the parts that, that aren't universal to make it more universal uh, without, without leaving it as nothing, you know, like it, ha- it still has to be some kind of soup. It has to have enough ingredients that it's still soup and not uh, broth, a bowl of broth. And so uh, it's sort of this, this sort of thing where I, I feel something very specific and I write down a very specific scenario. And then by the time it becomes an effing bird, it is, it's not totally universal, but it's as universal as that, as that feeling is going to be. You know what I mean? And I, I think that's what makes it so easily resonant. And it's what makes people think that, for instance, I'm a big follower of American politics, which I am not. I'm Canadian and I, um, I avoid most American politics stuff if I can. Lucky because, you. <laughs> yeah, because I can, right? And I feel yeah. a little bit bad saying it. Like, I can sort of treat it like it's a thing that's on TV that I can turn off. And I know that that's not true for people who are living through it. You, you can't turn that off. And, and also, I have to be cautious not to be like the Canadian who's like, ha ha, we got it so much better up here. Because, you know, in some respects we do and in some respects we don't. And if I'm you know, if I'm going to sit and dunk on my neighbors to the south, I'm missing out on what is wrong with where I am. And so I need to, you know, personally, I need to focus on what needs to happen up here. But when I write, I try to write in a way that someone who is frustrated by what's happening in the United States is, is going to be able to resonate with it. And so I get a lot of replies that are about really specific things. And I have to say, I don't know what this is about. Uh, Like this is um, yesterday was the thing where I I, eventually I figured it out this morning why everybody was tweeting at me about going for a ride in a car. (laughs) What is this about? And I just started replying to some people. I'm like, I think this is an American political thing because I don't get it. Well, it's it's funny because they're always like bizarrely freakishly on point for the things that are going on. Well, so, and so to a certain extent, I like, I know the broad strokes of what's happening around the world. And I certainly do the thing in the morning where, so uh, one of the things with F and birds is I don't write it in the moment. I definitely have a cue of stuff written right now. Um, and this is the ghoulish way to think of it, but if I was to die today, F and birds would post for 200 more days. Holy cow. Uh, okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And so there's, there's a fairly deep cue there. And, uh, what I do is, uh, one of my, my morning rounds, like I literally, the first thing I do after I get up and make some coffee is I do a temperature check on Twitter and on Facebook and on Instagram. And I see if there's any kind of like, um, any kind of mood that I need to line up with. And if there's a pretty consistent mood amongst those places, I, I shuffle what's in the queue and I, I bump up something appropriate. Yeah. And so I do like, I, I, the, the, can we have a break between clusterfucks, uh, was written, I'm going to say three months ago, uh, but it came, but yesterday was the day that it was necessary, you know? Well, I'm I'm curious too. Hmm, how do I phrase this? So, <laughs> so like th- it feels like there's a line, there's a line to walk between catharsis and adding to negativity. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm I'm constantly in terror that I'm making things worse and not. Mm. Um, I had a conversation with, and actually we had, we had sort of pitched it around a little bit before, again, before all the things stopped happening in the world, but, uh, with a couple of other people who have, uh, 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 popular, you know, who have, who owe their business success 
to social media. Uh, we had pitched a panel around called uh, uh, feeling good about contributing to the downfall of society, <laughs> you know, because because we can both hate what social media is doing to everyone and also recognize that, yes, but we're only successful because it's there, you know, and how do we like, how do we say that we're the good guys? You know, how do we, how do we feel good about what we're doing? And I think that I do mostly tread on the, catharsis and not wallowing side of it every once in a while like i i posted one that said i'm losing my fucking will to live um but i did very carefully target that as being right in the middle of the american presidential debate (laughs) yeah because that was also what everybody was saying who was watching it and i watched some of that and i can understand like it was you're brave (laughs) yeah i was like why did i do this to myself i don't even (laughs) live in that country so, oh, so interesting. Okay, so it's like you you do think through like I mean you've got this huge queue, but you think through like what's what's gonna land right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, what what will people feel today? What will people resonate with today? Because I think that's the biggest thing is that it's uh, some of it is is that it's a joke, but a lot of it is that I'm just trying to line up with what everybody else is feeling. You know, I'm trying like trying to be relevant, emotionally relevant. Is there a an art or science behind uh which images you choose for those phrases yeah yeah because what will happen is i'll have um a pile of things that i felt uh and a pile of birds and i'll just start opening the birds and it's sort of i it's i'm not gonna say i go into like a trance or anything like that but i do (laughs) sort of but I, I go into the, a trance. <laughs> yeah. No, I put the bird on the page and I just sort of look at it, you know? And and so I'm drawing inspiration from my list of, of prompts of horrible things that have happened. And I'm looking at this bird. I'm like, well, what is this bird feeling? And I really just have a close look at their eyes because really that's where all that expression comes from. And actually that's part of why I love Buick's woodcuts of birds because they have very expressive eyes and that, and it makes this joke work. Um, and, uh, yeah, I, uh, I, yeah, I just sort of stare into their eyes and I let them tell me what they're thinking, <laughs> which sounds so weird, but I like, I, I understand how that works with writing. Like I, I, I love when Stephen King writes about writing and his writing process where he feels like sometimes he's just at the controls of a bulldozer trying to unearth something. And sometimes he feels like he just puts some people there and follows them around and sees what they do you know, and then writes it down. And I'm sort of that way with the birds. I like, I just follow them around and I see what they do. And I try to like, I give myself my prompts so I know that, you know, what my, my ideas are this week, but a lot of times just staring at them and and thinking about them. It was pure happenstance that you ended up with birds. If you had to choose, would you have chosen a different, you know, animal or anything else? Is there anything that you would have chosen differently? I think that one of the reasons why FM Birds is better than the original pitch to that media organization is birds. Uh, Because they have, at least the Buick version of birds, have very expressive eyes. And when I've tried it with other animals, like as a joke, uh, every once in a while FM Birds will post something that's not a bird just to mess with people and uh my favorite is there's a there's a crab i post this crab that has the caption look asshole i don't have time to explain and whenever <laughs> anyone says whenever anyone, anyone complains about it i just reply look asshole i don't have time to explain <laughs> and so um, anyways uh but they they don't have the expressions like they they are they are a different kind of joke and i think that if i had stuck with the original version of it uh, the rejected version of it. I think the rejected version of it wasn't as good. And I think that it probably would not have had the same impact because it was uh, less focused and it was, uh, it wasn't, it didn't have that magic of, of birds. And so, uh, you know, I'm super thankful for that spam email. Yeah. Now, have you seen any either Twitter handles or books or anything that look like they have been uh, inspired by effing birds and how do you feel about that <laughs> i see a lot of uh, uh twitter copycats and uh you know i just i i take pleasure in the fact that they don't tend to survive very long uh, and i think that you know that's not be, me being catty i think part of it is that effing bird survives because it has a business plan and effing bird survives because it has an income 
And because it has an income, I can devote the amount of time to it to make it successful that it needs. And if it didn't have an income, I, I couldn't. You know, It's why some of my projects have gone away, even ones that were beloved. Do you have a swear word that you just will not use, that you won't go yep. there with? Oh, yeah. There's a few. I like I I have a hard time with particularly uh, gendered curse words uh, because they tend to be so I, I recognize that in usage they have become less what their origin is. But I still, you know, I find them I don't want to say distasteful because I think the entire project is distasteful. <laughs> but um, I, I find them I, I just don't want to use them. I think that's the, the way to put it. And I think it's like there are some words uh, that are used to express that someone is of low intelligence that are socially acceptable to use. And there are some that were socially acceptable to use when I was a kid that are not socially acceptable to use now. And like I, I recognize the difference between those words. And I do also understand the feeling that all of them are socially, you know, unacceptable. And I, like, I, I have a particular fondness for the word idiot. I do understand where people are coming from when they talk about that being like a, 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 a tricky, a tricky word to use without like, without acknowledging the history of the word or the origins of the word. And, I, and so, you know, I, I feel maybe I'm a little bit of a, a hypocrite that there are some words I won't use because of their origins um, that have, you know, really transcended those origins in usage. Uh, and there are others that I will. And maybe some of that is just, you know, what I what I grew up with, you know, um, and, and I try to be I, I mean, I just try to keep that all in my head at the same time and and to and to draw lines for myself and i do have a bucket of words i won't use and sometimes people will say why don't you ever use this word and i say because i don't like that word you know <laughs> it's just it's, that's, it's your it's your thing man <laughs> my thing i get to do it how i want exactly uh somebody the other day was giving me a hard time about how he didn't like the way i did a thing and i said why don't you go make a beloved internet property run it your way <laughs> And, and they were very quiet after that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no, usually they block me when I say things like that. I'm like, if you want to criticize but not accept the criticism back, like, uh, you're not going to have a good time here. So my last question for you is for your American fans. Yeah. What are your recommended curses or effing birds uh, to get us through the next three weeks? You know what? Your election cycles are so goddamn long. We have a law about how long elections can last here, and they're like they're I don't, they're much much shorter than what you guys do. It's Jealous. Pretty, I think that all the ones I I think that I have an overuse of the word clusterfuck in the queue <laughs> for the next little while because I really I like I don't want to be the Cassandra, <laughs> but I feel like that's what things are heading towards like it just feels like it's a big looming disaster and so there's uh i have a lot of stuff scheduled about uh clusterfucks and exhaustion um because i really realize that that's where people are at the limit of their emotional bandwidth yeah. and they they're like uh at the at risk of checking out at the one time where they probably shouldn't check out you know? yeah people are probably feeling numb yeah, More exactly. Than else. Yeah. yeah. And yeah, so yeah. that's my that's sort of my 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 plan for the next little bit is uh, is clusterfucks exhaustion. Actually, I should just look in the queue and see what I have here. Let me just open this up. I'm a big fan of uh, automated tools so that you don't have to stay on Twitter all day long, because yeah. like uh, if you do. Oh, yeah, I got, I got one. This is motherfuckers inbound. That's one of the ones. <laughs> uh, let's see. Uh, yeah. Uh, oh, you know what? There's a lot about not caring in the next little bit, too. And I think I might have to be careful with those because those are. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. Here's one. This is scheduled for Tuesday, the 13th of October, but I might move it up. It's to stop fucking up your own shit. Oh, and there's a lot about uh, about not talking anymore. There's an oh, my God, shut up. <laughs> that's sitting here. Like, you know what? I probably could have deployed that a few you know, back during the the uh, the debate. But no. Well. But uh, yeah, those are my those are those are my themes. Those are my American election themes. Uh, like just like, but, you know, take care of yourself. Self-care, you know, uh, it's there's logging off is an option. And 
know, if you don't react angrily to something on Twitter today, that's actually not going to have an impact on the election, you know? And well, and, and I think also, too, you know, finding your own version of effing birds. Like, right. you know, you use it for catharsis. So f- you figure out, don't just rely, I mean, obviously, buy, buy Aaron's book, you know, <laughs> follow, the, follow effing that- birds. There's a and weekly, planner. <laughs> weekly planner and, uh, and, a, and, a, and a 2021 calendar, thanks to the fine people at Andrews McMeal. I'm so pleased that the people who make the Garfield calendar also make an F of Birds calendar right now because yeah, I think that everything I do at this point is a competition with Garfield. And so <laughs> like, I like I I'll be happy once I get the restaurant. But, you know, <laughs> for now, let's uh, let's just keep let's outsell Garfield calendars this let's year. you know what i can't think of a of a more important or better goal to have in 2020 <laughs> <laughs> oh thank aaron thank you so much for taking the time to talk and walk through your process and the thingy behind it um i know you are doing an important service for a lot of people so thank you for joining me oh thanks for having me this is actually a really fun conversation to start a week um i uh, was like it's like, okay, I'm going to drink a lot of coffee. Let's do this. This is the first thing I'm doing this week. How are we going to do? And uh, this, is, this is a really, really solid start to the week. So thank awesome. you so much. Thank you. You can find Aaron everywhere at FNBirds and FNBirds.com or at Aaron Reynolds. I'll put links in the show notes along with links to Aaron's favorite nonprofits. Just a reminder that you can find the podcast on Instagram at LoveWhatYouLovePod, on Twitter at WhatYouLovePod, and the website is lovewhatyoulovepod.com. Zeke Rodriguez Thomas at Mind Jam Media provided that heroic editing assistance, and you can find Zeke at mindjammedia.com. Also, a reminder that all of the transcripts for Love What You Love are available for everyone on the website. Thanks to the hilarious and always thoughtful Emily White, as always, for the fantastic transcripts. If you need transcripts, reach out to her at hireemilywhite at gmail.com. The music for Love What You Love is called Inspiring Hope by Pink Sounds. A link to that artist is included in the show notes. Okay, y'all, go out there and love the hell out of whatever it is that you love, including swearing. You need it, and we need it. Thanks for listening. Let's hang out again soon. It's worth fighting for.